minutes about how to, thank you, how to find reliable health information and avoid unreliable health information on the internet and just out there in the universe. I'll be joined by David Gorski and Harriet Hall, my colleagues at Science Based Medicine website, and from down under, all the way from Australia, Rachel Dunlop, who's fighting the fight down there. So welcome, everyone. Um, <laughs> and of course, I'm Stephen Novella. I'm the, the founding editor of Science Based Medicine. Uh, the title of this talk is Dr. Google, uh, just as a euphemism to talk about the fact uh, that a lot of people these days are finding health information on the internet. In fact, uh, sometime around 2000, uh, searches for health information exceeded pornographic information on the internet. <laughs> Only took about 20 years for that to happen. <coughs> um, I actually took this picture on Tuesday. I was at Google. They invited uh, myself and my colleagues from the Skeptics Guide to the Universe to talk to Google about health information. So <laughs> we actually reversed the flow a little bit there. Um, so I'm going to cover just some basic principles about where do you find health information and how to think about those sources of information and the, the kind of pitfalls that you'll need to avoid. So number one, of course, a very reliable source of health information is your doctor. And you know, don't be afraid to use that as a resource. Uh, of course, there's a huge spectrum of competence, ability to communicate, worldview, et cetera. So I always advise people with friends, family, whatever, to find a position that they feel comfortable with, that you can have access to, and that you can talk about these issues with, because that's going to be your single best source of information. It's their job to be your advocate in you know, all areas of health. So don't neglect that. Um, and there's other health-related experts. Physicians are not the only health experts. Uh, and there, you know, there are nurses and nutritionists and physical therapists and dentists, et cetera. So there's lots of other allied health professionals that have their domain. So again, they're excellent sources of information. I'm not going to talk about that anymore, however, in this talk. Um, however, probably most of the health information that gets into your brain comes through the media it, because that's more of a passive way of receiving information. It's pushed to you. You don't necessarily go out and specifically search for a piece of information. The information is just out there in the media and you come across it. And even when you do go out and look for information, if you go on to Google and search for something, you are probably going to come to a news journalistic outlet as one of the main sources of health information. So whether you're just, again, passively receiving or going out and looking for information, you have to know how the media presents information. So I'm going to spend the first half or so of of my 20 minutes talking about that. But there's also publications, books, and magazines. Again, the full gamut of quality and reliability. Um, movies, there are you know, people make documentary <coughs> movies covering a single health topic. And you know, it's amazing how many are out there. There's a documentary movie about Lyme disease, uh, about um, Morgellons disease, you know, which is not real, uh, the, the notion that um, people are in being uh, invaded by some kind of bizarre parasite that's causing these sort of plastic bands or, or fibers to extrude from their skin. And, you know, mainstream physicians think that this is a, by and large, a manifestation of, uh, of a uh, delusional parasitosis, a, you know, a psychiatric illness. They're just scratching themselves and working clothing fibers into the, into the wounds that they're creating. But there's a whole subculture thriving on the internet saying, nope, this is a real mysterious disease that your doctor's not going to tell you about. Um, and YouTube now, of course, so that's, uh, you know, part of the internet, but, you know, most of the videos that you're going to see on health-related topics, <coughs> uh, topics will be on YouTube. Um, and, again, pretty much any health topic you could think about, somebody has made a YouTube video explaining their perspective. Uh, and, of course, there's other uh, aspects, other corners of the internet, blogs, podcasts, uh, commercial sites, professional sites, and they all have a, their, own, their own character, um, and other commercial sources. So the people actually trying to sell you something are going to be a major source <coughs> of information. Uh, and there's also what I like to call pseudo-experts, uh, people who claim to be experts but either have no special training whatsoever, they just hung up a virtual shingle on the internet and are presenting themselves as an expert because that's how they're going to make their living, uh, or uh, there are even now licensed professions that are based entirely on pseudoscience. So like 
homeo homeopathy, for example. You could be a licensed homeopath and present yourself as a state-certified expert, health expert. And meanwhile, um, your entire profession is based upon nothing but pure pseudoscience. But if you're not intimately familiar with homeopathy, you know, if, you know, general members of the public, what they only know, well, this is a licensed health professional. What the government certainly wouldn't license somebody unless their profession were legitimate. Um, so that creates a lot of mischief. So as you can see, there's a lot of sources of health information, most of which is bullshit, right? Most of which is misleading or biased or just flawed or just not very carefully vetted. Um, you know, it's also worth mentioning that your physician is unlikely to use any of these sources when they're uh, developing, their, when they're looking for health information. Certainly, I don't use YouTube as a source for my own knowledge <laughs> of medical topics. Um, so it's, 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 it's interesting to think about, well, what sources do they go to? And I'll touch on that a little bit as well. So I do want to delve in deeper into health journalism because, again, uh, this is the single um, most likely source from which you are going to get your health information. Uh, despite Web 2.0 and, the, and uh, the Internet and all the new ways in which information is being pushed out there, the traditional media still has about 10 times as much access to the public and is getting about 10 times as much information out there as all the other, you know, the new uh, Web 2.0 Internet-based information. Of course, those lines are going to cross at some point, and that's changing every year. The Internet is, you know, gaining ground um, every year, and traditional media is shifting over to the Internet. But, you know, right now, people are more likely to see something on TV on a, on a regular newscast than they are to find it on the Internet. Um, so here are the, the problems with, with health media reporting uh, that it's important to keep in mind when you're assessing any news item, that health news item that you come across, what, no matter what the venue is, the Internet or traditional. Um, often, the journalist reporting on the story is not a science journalist, and specifically not a health journalist. They're not a specialist. And this makes a huge, uh, a huge factor. This is, it has a huge influence on the quality of the stories. Unfortunately, because of, we're, because of the fact that we're in the transition from traditional media to internet-based media, uh, the, uh, the traditional business model that's, that has in, in years past supported full-time professional specialist journalists really is evaporating. And so generalist journalists, you know, the, you know someone who last week was covering a dog show, um, is now covering a health news item. And they bring the same uh, experience and level of, you know, often fluff journalism to weighty and complicated science, you know, health topics. Um, and they just have no way of navigating through this. So they are, they themselves, um, you know, don't, they, they, they commit all of the fallacies that I'm going to go over in terms of uh, the quality of the reporting that they give. And I'll give you some specific examples that are kind of fun. Here are some very specific things that, again, a, a, an experienced journalist and certainly an expert, you know, a, a scientist or a physician would, would immediately know to do, but, uh, but a generalist reporter d just d doesn't understand this distinction, and that is the difference between preliminary and definitive research. Uh, right now, um, and this, you know, in science in general, there are, there's a pyramid of, of studies that get published, that, that are performed and published. At the base, most studies are preliminary. They're exploratory. They're, uh, you know, throwing out new ideas and seeing if they have any viability. There are small studies that are, that are relatively easy and quick to do uh, and, and are uh, not that expensive to carry out just to see if this is something that's worth further exploration. And then as if studies that show promise get then get more elaborate studies get done, larger trials, more rigorous until eventually you get to large, multi-center, placebo-controlled, if that's appropriate, double-blind, rigorous, large studies that are consensus or definitive trials, that the, where the, the results of that study are something that you can hang your hat on. Like, that's probably the answer. And it's nice if you have three or four such studies to really tell us, you know, if a treatment is safe and effective, for example. Um, but th what that means is that for every definitive, reliable study out there, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of preliminary, small, completely unreliable studies. However, now in, in the, in, so before the Internet, what would largely happen is the only people who would hear about these small, preliminary, exploratory studies are scientists. 
We would read them in technical journals that you're, you know you probably don't get a, you know uh, the Nature Medicine at delivered to your home or to other technical journals that you know you really can't read unless you have a certain amount of training and education in that specific field. I mean I can't read articles outside of my specialty in medicine. There's there's too much jargon I don't understand. Um, so in any case, th this would all happen behind the scenes at meetings in the in the literature, and then eventually the the ideas that that had merit would filter their way to the top, and then when a new treatment was passing definitive trials and, and ready for prime time, ready to actually be used, then you would he read about it in, in the news and in the magazines, and the, then the lay public would, would re read about it. That's not pristinely true, but that was largely what would happen. Now, uh, you're hearing about every single preliminary study that gets done that some journalist can write a sensationalist headline to. And there's no distinction being made between the preliminary study and the definitive study. So all you hear is a study showed that there is a link between A and B, or that this may be a treatment for the common cold, or whatever. And it's all noise. 99 times out of 100, that's not going to pan out. And scientists know it. So, but a journalist, all they see is, oh, a study found a link between these two interesting things. Let me publish a headline that says this. And they, put, they, they fail to put it into the proper context. You know, this is an, a, as much enough of a problem that um, you know we we have to wonder that we I think we need to adapt to this new situation. Uh, in fact, when I was at Google giving a, giving a health related talk, somebody asked a very astute question: "Is like, well, what should we do about this situation? Should we, in some way, filter these studies so that the public isn't reading every single preliminary study out there as if it's a, a definitive news item?" And that's a really good question. There's no. I, answer to that question right now. What I think, actually I have written about this before, and what I, my one suggested solution I threw out there was that journals need to segregate their articles in their, in, you know, from, they need to say, that here's a section where we're going to publish, you know, what we consider to be large definitive trials where you could, the results actually mean something. And then here's a section where we're, where we're publishing pilot preliminary studies. Please ignore the results of these studies unless you're a researcher in this area, the don't don't send out a press release. Don't write a headline. It's like a big warning label. Preliminary data. Do not rely upon this data. Something like that needs to be done. Just to at least, you know, I'm not saying to censor or to not give this. I mean, the, that genie's out of the bottle. I mean, yes, all the information needs to be out there. That's also how we find information now. I go online and search for for preliminary studies. I want to see what's going on. Um, but it needs. But I again, it needs to come with that warning label. To, so at least, and, and the public needs to be educated to the fact of what that means. That means, no, don't run out and buy the supplement based upon this preliminary study because uh, don't make health decisions about what your, your lifestyle and what you're eating and what you're buying. This is totally preliminary data. We also know, um, and we write and talk about this all the time, that when you look at the literature and you look at these preliminary studies, the, the results of most of these studies are wrong. It's not only that they're random, they're mostly wrong. And they're mostly wrong for, and that's not to say that most of what scientists believe is wrong or most of what the literature says is wrong, because when you get to the definitive trials, that's what we're using as the standard, right? We're saying and when you compare the preliminary studies to the eventual definitive trials, most of the preliminary studies are wrong. And the reason why that is, is a few reasons. One is publication bias. Journals want to publish sexy, positive studies. Researcher bias, which I'll get to in some more detail later, but researchers do things to make their studies more likely to come out positive. Um, and other reasons as well. So there's this huge bias towards making data look good and look positive. Uh, and so there's a, it's not only is it wrong, but it's mostly falsely positive, which of course generates the headlines. Uh, so that's the noise that you're dealing with now and that you have to filter out yourself because there's no longer any filters between you and all of this preliminary research that's getting done and that's massively misleading. The, the, um, I'll comment on another aspect of this which is interesting and this relates to the health journalism thing because there are so few science journalists now, not enough to really cover the science news and specifically you know, health science specialists. Um, a, lot of, a lot of news outlets are relying upon press releases. And in fact, to the point where a lot of news outlets that are just aggregating news, just bringing you the news and aggregating into one spot online that they want to drive people to so they get the ad revenue, right? That what they do is they just take press releases and then they publish it as a news item. It's, it, but it's a completely unedited, unaltered press release. 
And when you search on that topic, which of course I do all the time when I'm prepping for talks and the show or whatever, I search on a topic and I get 50 links to the word for word identical news item about what some recent study is because they all just copied the press release. Now you would think that a press release coming from a university about one of their own researchers' research would be pretty reliable. But you'd be wrong if you thought that because when you look at these press releases, they're, they're um, all promotional and sensationalistic too. They weren't written by the scientist. They were written by somebody in the press office who is trying to, and they make all the same, they're just journalists too, trying to get attention to their university. Their job is to, is to drive attention to their researchers and their institution. So they completely distort the outcome of the research, the significance of it. Um, sometimes they get their findings completely wrong, and you wonder if they even spoke to the researchers before they put the, the press release out. And also, mixed in with those press releases from well-meaning but misguided university press rooms, there are press releases from companies who are trying to get, look, they're trolling for investors. So they're saying, oh man, we're right on the cusp of this amazing discovery, and they're just looking for people to invest in their company. They're abusing the science journalist infrastructure as a free advertising. Uh, and it's amazing, and we've covered stories like that all the time. Like, remember the guy who regrew the end of his finger, who didn't really regrow the end of his finger? That was his brother's company who sent out a press release you know, looking for investors in their magic powder. It wasn't a news item at all. So that's what you're dealing with with, uh, with health science news. Another big mistake that journalists make is they confuse the authority of a single expert with the consensus of the expert community. So this is classic. What they do is they talk to N expert. <coughs> And whatever that expert says, that's the answer, right? Because he's an expert. He's got to know what the answer is. I don't have to talk to two or three experts. I just I spoke to my expert. I you know, spoke to him for two hours. This is how it works most often. And I pulled out you know, two or three quotes that I plugged into the story I wrote before I even spoke to him, right? Because I read the press release. Um, and now, you know, if you're even bothered to write, bothered to writing your own story, your own copy, uh, and so you have an expert to back up what you're saying. But, um, and I've, I've been on both ends of that, right? I you know, blog, so I talk to other experts to try to get their take on things. And I also am interviewed a lot by journalists, and I know how that goes too. And it's amazing how what you tell them gets translated into what works into the final article. And sometimes they're listening to you and they're actually letting you guide the story. And sometimes they're just fishing for quotes. They could plug into a story they already wrote. They already know what the headline is. They already know what the conclusion is because it's fitting into a formula that they that it just exists. It's a, a, this, the journalist formula that's meant to drive interest, which I'm going to, again, cover in, in a little bit more detail. Um, they don't understand the fact that if you talk to a random expert, you're gonna, it's like you're rolling the dice and you're going to get a random expert's opinion take on a topic. If that topic is at all controversial, chances are that expert will not reflect the really broad consensus of opinion. You may, in fact, be talking to a crank. And in fact, the odds are pretty good. It's not a random, you're not randomly going out there. You're looking for experts who have a media footprint. And the cranks go out of their way to have a big media footprint. They're very good at self-promotion. That's how they promote, that's how they rise to the top, by self-promotion, as opposed to legitimate experts who rise to the top because, well, they did good research and got published. You know, that, we like to think that that's the case. But disproportionately, the, you know, the more cranky you are, the more likely you are to be rising to the top because you are just good at self-promotion. So yeah, so they have a huge media presence <coughs> and they're very likely to draw the attention of a journalist. So a journalist is, is actually more likely to talk to somebody who, who does not reflect the scientific consensus than somebody who is just a workaday scientist who would give you the, the sort of boring, distilled consensus opinion. So the system is actually geared towards misrepresenting the actual conclusion of, of any controversy or even not so controversial topic. Um, but it gets worse than that too because um, there's uh, something called false balance which we complain about a lot in science-based medicine because uh, again, this is the journalistic formula. There's two sides to every story. Well, no, sometimes there's one, sometimes there's five, you know, but you know, they take this, we have to find somebody who thinks the other side no matter how solid the consensus is that they're talking about, they need to find some expert who says the opposite so they could, they could, present, they could present it as a controversy and that they you know, present themselves as having uh, done a balanced job. So that's false balance, right? In fact, the, the balance of the article should reflect the balance of opinion in the scientific community, not just two random experts on opposite ends. 
Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned, they often will find their way to fake experts that don't even have the qualifications, let alone <coughs> having qualifications but having an out of the mainstream opinion. It's actually tricky, you know, if, you know, if, if sometimes I, I will address a new topic I've never really looked at in any detail before, and like I'm, so I'm starting pretty much from scratch. I did this actually 10 years ago now, when I first was, um, you know, hit with this, this claim that vaccines cause autism. I said, okay, I'm just gonna start from scratch and take a look at this question for myself, and spent like six months just, just reading the literature and, the, and what was written out there before I ever wrote about it. And it was difficult, you know, it was challenging to sort through all of the opinions and to finally get to the point where you like knew who had the last word on each particular part of that claim. Um, that's a lot of work. And you know, again, I, w I had a huge background of scientific and medical information to start from. So a journalist trying to do that, you know, may, may not get to the right conclusion at the end. And I've seen journalists, you know, who are good science journalists who spend a long time delving into a question and at the end of the day they come to the exactly wrong conclusion because they make some mistake about how they're interpreting the literature. Um, so it, uh, that, that knowing you know, how to put everything into context again is, is critical. And then we, you know, we, I don't know who, who invented the term manufacturversy. It's, it's one of those things just every, we all start using it now. Uh, making up a, a fake controversy where one does not exist. So again, like the do vaccines cause <coughs> autism, that's not a scientific controversy. The, the, the data is in, it's settled, but, you know, settled science doesn't make really sexy headlines and sell, you know, drive traffic to your website. So um, you manufacture a controversy where none exists. Uh, and of course, there are groups that are ideologically dedicated to a particular point of view, and they, of course, like to manufacture the controversy as well, because they don't want, you know, obviously they're, they don't want the settled answer to be they're wrong, so they say, at the very least, they say, well, this is controversial. Okay, so here's um, an example of, in one article, a lot of the things I just talked about. This is from MN MSNBC, but this headline in one version or another, one permutation or the other, was reproduced in every major news outlet. So they, everyone blew it. Nobody got this right. Acupuncture, real or fake, best for back pain. In fact, the study that they're talking about showed the exact opposite of that. It showed that acupuncture does not work. Uh, what they did was, if I, you know, I know I've, I speak about this a lot because it's my favorite example now of just the absolute wrong reporting of a science news item. They compared real acupuncture by an acupuncturist doing what they think they need to do to do real acupuncture. They compared that to sham acupuncture where you stick needles in the wrong place. They compared it to placebo acupuncture where you don't even insert a needle, you just poke the skin with a toothpick. And those groups were all, those, so those were three blinded comparisons. And then they had, for completeness, a non-intervention group. Not a standard intervention group. That was misreported almost you, you know, ubiquitously. But a non-intervention group, meaning they took people with chronic back pain and they did nothing except whatever they were already doing and, and failing because they had failed you know, th their treatment and they had chronic back pain despite whatever they were already doing. So of course everyone who got some intervention felt like they were doing better than the people who had no intervention at all. That was an unblinded comparison. You can't make any conclusions based upon that comparison. All that, the only reason, in fact, to, comp to include that, that group, the non-intervention group, was to show that the study was capable of showing a difference in outcome. So you show that all of the intervention groups did better than the non-intervention group. That just means, okay, this study was powered and designed in such a way, and the outcomes were, were measuring something so that you can see a difference. But that difference means nothing. It's all placebo effect because it was unblinded. The, the study was looking at those three groups, acupuncture, sham acupuncture, and placebo acupuncture. That was the blinded comparison. And there was no difference at all. That means it doesn't work. Acupuncture doesn't work. Doesn't matter where you stick the needles, doesn't matter if you stick the needles. The two variables that are acupuncture had no effect. It doesn't work. That's not what any of the headlines said. What the headline said was acupuncture works whether or not it's real. That's like saying, you know, if it, again, I, I, my favorite comparison, which puts it into crystal clear perspective, a pharmaceutical company doing a study where they have two doses of their drug, a placebo of their drug, and a non-intervention group, where they don't do anything. And all of the three, you know, placebo medicine and two doses of medicine have no difference in outcome, but they all did better than the people who had nothing. And the company says, 
our drug works. In fact, it's so powerful, even the placebo of our drug works. <laughs> I'm not sure anyone would buy that. You know, but every science journalist bought that that was essentially true for this acupuncture study in chronic back pain, complete mm -hmm. fail. And they were just reproducing the press release. They didn't do any of their own background research. Nobody, no one talked to me about this, I could tell you that. But they, they just, or any of us, and they never, nobody came to science-based medicine or any of the people who have been writing about acupuncture for years. Uh, they didn't talk to any skeptic, anyone who is not other, any, they talked to acupuncturists and the people who did the study and they just, or they just copied the press release. There was no actual journalism where they investigated what this really means. And they just bought this ridiculous rationalization wholesale. All right, H here's a fake controversy. This is something new I haven't talked about before. I mean, this particular news item, I sp I've spoken about this, this treatment before. CCSVI, so this is, this is interesting because we, um, over the last three to four years, we've been able to watch a scientific controversy evolving from origin through we're getting close to the end. And then we'll see what, it, what its ultimate fate is. I predict it will live on the fringes of quackery. But uh, a few years ago, an Italian vascular surgeon uh, by the name of Zamboni uh, developed this hypothesis that multiple sclerosis, MS, is actually caused by blockage in the veins that drain the brain, rather than an autoimmune inflammatory disease, which is what the last 50 years of research shows it to be. Uh, he said, nope, you're all wrong. Forget all those hundreds of studies and all that immunology and all that stuff. It's a blockage in the veins. And you can treat it by opening up the veins with a, with a procedure, now called the liberation procedure. So of course, if you're an MS sufferer and the standard therapy is not working for you, and someone says, I could cure you, of course you want to believe that, right? That's wishful thinking. You know, everyone, you'll buy that for a dollar, right? Um, so hence the controversy, right? So uh, studies have been done replicate. So Zamboni published a study saying 100% of IMS patients had blockage in their venous system. That's pretty good, 100%. We never see that in real science, but yeah, okay. Um, you know, that means he, there was some bias, and if bias can explain some of the outcome, maybe it explains all the outcome. I don't know. Uh, it's been replicated now, and uh, actually, for a, for a hypothesis that not many people took seriously, there's a lot of research being done on this, uh, which is interesting. Um, a lot of people who tried to replicate Zamboni's research, no one got the same results he did. Not even him when he, when he repeated it. So the 100% the thing was not real. Um, most of the studies show no correlation between venous blockage and MS. Some show some correlation, although people with non MS neurological disease also have blockage, but not as much as MS. And the general population who have no neurological disease also have blockage, but not as much as, pe much as people with neurological disease. So we don't know what that means. We don't know if it's real. If it is real, doesn't mean it's causative of MS. Maybe the inflammation is causing some blockage, and maybe that's even contributing to sy symptoms. Maybe he's onto something. Not the cause of MS, though. It just is not plausible, and it goes against too much prior research. Um, there's also been some other studies, uh, one, one interesting study where they tied off the vein, the jugular veins in rats and see what happens and they don't get MS. So, they're, you know, they're rats, they're not humans, but that, that's an interesting way to approach that question. And there's now we're starting to get some treatment trials. The one out of Canada that was recently published, that's why this news item came out. Um, where, and these are non-blinded, not randomized, it's people who are referring themselves for the liberation procedure, we're just seeing what happens. And you know what? They're not getting better. There's, so far, it, it shows no effect. If anything, the unblinded nature of that data would bias it towards the positive. But even still, there's no effect. And a subset of those patients, as a complication of the procedure, their, ve their veins completely clotted off, and they didn't get worse. And these are people who already had MS. That's pretty telling, too. So all the data seems to be pointing in the direction of this is not the cause of MS. It does not make MS worse, and treating it does not make MS better. <coughs> so, and it's, you know, it doesn't, it's not that plausible from a, the point of view of the fit last 50 years of MS research. In the neurological community, I could tell you as a neurologist, just chatting with my colleagues, they think this is utter BS. That's sort of the consensus opinion. But they're still giving it due diligence because, you know, you got to go through the motions, right? You got to give it, you know, you, just saying, I think this is not true is not enough in science. You have to show that it's not true. Um, and the studies are being done in a way that if it worked, we'd see it. You know, otherwise they're pointless, right? Um, they're getting done, just not showing that it's effective. 
But immediately, immediately, a subculture of conspiracy thinking emerged on, on the internet, just popped into existence with pre-made arguments and big pharma conspiracy mongering. And of course, now the neurologists somehow are now in a conspiracy not to treat MS. I mean, it really was bizarre from a neurologist's point of view. Um, here's an, a recent article written by a journalist trying to cover this, you know, pseudo controversy. There's a little bit of controversy in there, but it's a completely asymmetrical one. 95% think this is nothing to this, and there's a subset of people who think it deserves more research, not that it's proven. No one is bold enough to say that. Um, so this is the quote from the article. Zamboni's theory challenged the entrenched, but although unproven autoimmune model of MS, one that underlies a mindset and a US $13 billion in industry of symptom modifying drugs. It also unleashed the specter of patients demanding an unproven procedure. Everything but that last line is completely wrong in that article. Um, so unproven, unless you count the last 50 years of research in multiple sclerosis. I mean, what's unproven is not a fair background characterization of the autoimmune theory of multiple sclerosis. There's hundreds of studies showing in a lot of detail that this is an autoimmune disease. I mean, it really isn't just like some random idea we threw out there. Um, you know, the, notice the big pharma conspiracy mongering in there, the $13 billion industry. Yeah, that's medicine. You know, it's a, the, all, of, all of medicine is a big industry. So you could always pull that out as, uh, to, to support any conspiracy theory. She also characterized the, the standard treatment as symptom-modifying drugs. That's a very specific claim. She must have got it from somewhere. It's not true. The MS drugs, the, there's like about six drugs now, are specifically disease-modifying. Now, in 1990 or earlier, that statement would be true. We had no disease-modifying drugs for MS. We would shorten the duration of exacerbations. We would treat symptoms. We would improve quality of life, but nothing that altered the course of the disease. But that's not been true for 30 years. We now have about six drugs approved in multiple countries, Europe and the US and Canada, that, that reduce the number of exacerbations that, that slow down the course of the disease significantly, both by MRI criteria as well as clinical criteria. That's just wrong. It's just a completely wrong characterization of the treatment. So this is a journalist trying to cover an interesting topic, and she gets all the details wrong and not in a random direction. These are all biased in the direction of there's a conspiracy to uh, suppress uh, this new treatment by entrenched, entren entrenched interests in a, this unproven <coughs> symptom-modifying hypothesis. And I, I wonder who she spoke to you, that gave her this characterization of this issue. She didn't speak to any neurologists I know. Or if she did, she didn't listen to them because she had already written the story and wasn't actually doing investigation. She was doing quote mining. Um, that's probably what happened. All right, here's another one. Um, it's probably too small to see, but if the, the little bar, the, the black part I, I um, looked at there is, that's Dr. Magda Havas. Anyone know that name? Anyone from Canada? She's a Canadian doctor. So she's the one expert out there who is um, pushing this idea of uh, Wi-Fi electrosensitivity, that uh, light bulbs and you know, Wi-Fi and cell phones and whatnot are, are damaging our health, causing diabetes and all kinds of poor health. And so she's the media expert. So if you're a journalist and you're writing about the Wi-Fi controversy, you're going to find her. If you search on it, she will come up. And she is very amenable to talking to the media. So the journalists cite her as their expert that they went to to find out what's really going on. And she gives them the minority 1% opinion on this whole thing, whereas the rest of the scientific community says, um, not much plausibility there. I won't go as far as saying it's impossible, although some people do, but I wouldn't go so far as saying it's impossible. But there's really plausibility, very low evidence. There's been about 30,000 studies looking at this, and it's negative. You know, there's no effect here. The, the World Health Organization has reviewed all this data. You know, other organizations have reviewed all this data, and there's just no signal there. Of course, you can't rule out a tiny risk, but with the amount of data that we have, it's got to be insignificant. It's got to be too small to worry about. But to talk to her, it's like a scourge on modern life. That's who, the, that's who the media go to, nine times out of 10, on this issue, because she's the media expert. Um, some other aspects of health journalism to talk about, obviously sensationalism. Force potential applications. This is now the formula 
I, I want to talk about. This is the four, and you, it's funny. Actually, there was a recent, after, you know, I've written about this topic, uh, another a, a doctor wrote an article in Nature, I think it was in Nature, about, um, he wrote, like, how to write a science, a science article, and it was a parody. Like, this, like, instructions to a journalist, and, and it was perfect. It was like, I should have wrote that myself, because it was a perfect <laughs> article. And but I'm going to focus on a couple of things they say. So you have the human interest anecdote in medicine that's huge and health-related topics. You talk to the doctor who's just trying to cure people, and isn't he nice, and the patients love him, and they saved his life. And then they talk to the skeptic, and we're a talking head, saying, nope, it doesn't work, and the evidence is negative. And let's go back to the, doc the nice doctor in his white coat treating the patients and, making them and saving their lives. Completely distorted presentation and you know, uh, with because of the human interest angle, I don't think the journalists intend to so profoundly distort the issue that way. That's just they're just following their formula. You find a person who's affected by this, you know, personally. They're the human interest hook. But of course, once you do that, that completely sets the tone for the whole article. And then the skeptical talking head, we could say anything; it doesn't matter. The the the, the story is the the people whose lives were saved by this crusader. Um, the, the, you know, the facts get completely lost in the reporting, uh, the skeptical talking head. So here's a funny one. So a cure for the common cold may finally be achieved as a result of remarkable discovery in Cambridge Laboratory. Right? That's not true. So it has nothing to do with the research. The research is about how anti uh, antibodies can enter cells and attack viruses. So, but here's the formula. Any research about viruses could potentially lead to a cure for the common cold. <laughs> That's it. That's the hook. Because the journalist goes, hmm, here's an obscure immunology, you know, basic science study about antibodies entering cells. What's the hook here? Viruses, cold. And Jimmy, I, I just imagine, you know, asking the researcher, so one day could this research lead to discoveries which help us cure the common cold? What's the researcher going to say? No, absolutely not, never. They'll say, well, sure, theoretically, it's possible. Great, there we go. There's my headline, cure for the common cold. <laughs> Right, you guys have read about the invisibility cloak, Harry Potter's invisibility cloak? There's no Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. And so anytime you do any kind of research that has anything to do with manipulating light waves, Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. <laughs> so that's the forced application. Find what this means to the, ev every, ev the average everyday person. Doesn't matter how tenuous the connection is. But they're just taking interesting basic science studies and finding something that it has absolutely nothing to do with and that's the headline, that's the hook. But that's what gets reported. That's what gets reported. I'm actually running a little long, and I don't want to overshadow my colleagues too much. So even good journalists have a hard time deciphering the complicated you know, uh, science out there because science is hard. It's really complicated. I find it very hard. Once I step even a little bit out of my specialty, it's really challenging, and I have to really, all I could do is talk to experts and try to understand what they think. Uh, you know, they dumb it down for me and give me a summary of what they really think. That's the best you could really do once you're outside of your narrow area of expertise. And of course, if, you know, if you're not a scientist, that's all of science, right? But even if you are a scientist, that's all of science except for your area of expertise. And you really have to understand that. Um, but you know, you can, you can get to the point where you can, yeah, you could translate into a reasonable you know, story uh, about what's going on putting studies into context, un and there are genuine controversies out there. It's not like all of science is settled, and all you gotta do is find out what the settled co you know, consensus answer is. There's real controversies out there, and those are very hard to navigate. Um, peer review is another one. What does peer review mean? You know, people think peer reviewed means this is solid established science. No, it doesn't. It means that the, the journal thought that, that it should be published. Most peer reviewed studies are crap. Most of them are preliminary studies. We get back to that, right? I mean, the peer review process itself is being examined. Is it adequate? Does it really do what we say it does? And even when it works, it, it's, it's just the beginning of the evaluation of a study, not the end of the evaluation of the study. Peer review is, means, all right, you're above the bar, we'll publish you in the literature, and now the scientific community will pick you apart and decide if you actually are worth anything. That's, the, that's what you gotta wait for, the scientific community to pick it apart. Peer review does not a guarantee of this is reliable outcome, not at all. The journalists, however, generally don't get that. False legitimacy doesn't get much worse than NCAM, the National Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine. I talked about licensing, licensing pseudo-experts like homeopaths and acupuncturists. There's a lot of things out there that to the public would seem like 
the imp imprimatur of legitimacy that are not real, um, that are not, do not, are not actually tied to legitimate scientific legitimacy. Um, I don't have time to go over that. Uh, so th there's also lots of um, sources of bias in studies. I actually touched on that you know, earlier in the talk. Um, so there are other sources of health, in health information. This has really just been talking about the media, but you can actually, when you go online to look for information, you may not be dealing with the media. You may be dealing with other sources of information. A lot of them are going to be commercial. People are trying to sell you something. It's amazing to me when I talk to like alternative medicine proponents or people who are into supplements or natural remedies, how successful the, the marketing campaign of alternative and natural treatments has been. They don't even realize that they're being pitched a commercial. They don't. I mean, most people I talk to about that who are really proponents say, oh no, the commercial, that's something that pharmaceutical companies do and that your doctor does. This guy though, this is this guru, he's just giving me information. He's like a real you know, crusader. No, he's selling you something. This guy's making <coughs> millions of dollars. I don't make a dime on any of this. This guy's making millions of dollars, but I'm the one who's selling you something and this guy is the one to be trusted, like talking about Mercola or the Health Ranger or whoever. These guys are making millions of dollars selling stuff and, and focusing, you know, to, um, uh, honing what they're saying towards the sale. It's a pitch. They're used car salesmen. And, I, and, I, and I, it's amazing to me that, that you know, the, the marketing has been so successful that peop most people don't get that. Um, if a site, if a website uh, is the product of a single individual, it's very, that, uh, you should be very cautious about believing the information on that site. No authority does not rest in any single individual. It doesn't mean they don't have something useful to say or they're not a useful conduit of information, but don't take any individual's word for anything. Not even mine, not, none of us. We, we are just individual. All, all we could do is do, the, do our best to make sense of a complicated scientific story. You really want to get, again, the consensus of the community is really your best bet. So be, care, be careful if that's being funneled through a single person with a single perspective. Um, group, uh, like group blogs or group sites do a little bit better, but you have to be careful of their ideology as well. Institutional sites, like academic institutions, are actually the best source of information on uh, health information. But even then, what I find and what we find is that when they're the, the subjects are non-controversial, they're great. When they're controversial, then politics intrude and then we find that the reliability kind of goes off the rails a little bit. So the more controversial the topic, the more skeptical you have to be of any individual source of information. Um, news outlets, I've already completely trashed what news outlets and why they're completely unreliable. I, I have to, I'm gonna end with this. This is, um, I just found this today. Somebody sent this to me today. And I had to share it with you. <coughs> pooping wrong is bad for your health. Did you guys know that you were pooping wrong? I bet, I bet everyone in this room has been pooping wrong their whole life. <laughs> Why choose to be unhealthy? All right, so here's the solution. I mean, look, there's a scientific anatomical chart explaining why you're pooping wrong. <laughs> when you're sitting, your, your muscles are kind of bent at an uncomfortable angle, and that, that closes off your anal sphincter. When you're squatting in a more natural posture, like because in the woods, you're going to squat, right? then the, the everything opens up and, and your experience is going to be much more natural. So, <laughs> the squatty potty. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> all you, you know, this puts you in a squatting position, opens up your anal sphincter and all your health <coughs> problems will go away. <laughs> right, so this, you know, this, this site looks newsy, you know, it's on the internet, they've got video, very slickly produced video. It's all, however, leading for you to buy this product. What's the scientific evidence for this? Zilch, none. It's just, there's, you know, and, and it's all based upon the naturalistic fallacy. Of, you know, the, the, if you watch the video, um, they say, you know, people squatted to poop for all of human history until the Industrial Revolution came along when we started sitting and we doubled life expectancy. I mean. No, then, <laughs> then all of our problems started when we started sitting on the toilet. So here we, here we have the solution. All right, I'll end there. Thank you, everyone.
good uh, morning still by 15 minutes, uh, everyone. Uh, I, before I get started, I'd like to just thank the uh, geniuses at the Apple Store because they basically saved my computer last night and uh, much of my talk. So I'm going to start out with what I think the very essence of the way we search for information on the internet is, and this is a famous quote from Isaac Asimov. Uh, there is a cult of ignorance in this country, in the United States, and there always has been. The strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. Google is this statement not only on steroids, but like on nuclear power, okay? And here, here, you know, Steve mentioned that, you know, health searches have finally surpassed porn searches, you know? Um, and this is just one topic, okay? This is breast cancer, and this is the number of posts that you see, uh, you know, since 2004 in a study that was just published uh, a month or two ago. Uh, and a lot of these, these posts range from blogs, and most of it's media websites, just as Steve said, but blogs are like about, you know, even though they're only about one quarter of the number, it's still a huge number, and you'll see this. So here's our friend, it's my little, my little lizard, he, and he's Googling cancer. <laughs> so can he have a PhD? <laughs> So, I, you know, in 20 minutes or 25 minutes, I, I'll try to get through some stuff that can hopefully serve you well. We, it, it, we've blogged about this sort of stuff a lot on science-based medicine, so. But first, I'm going to start with three sites that will come up on searches that if there's something on that site, you should not believe it. If I see, some, if I see on this site that it says that it rained yesterday, I'm going to go look at the weather report from yesterday to see if it actually did rain. Uh, in whatever part of the country they're talking about. Mercola, Joe Mercola, naturalnews.com, Mike Adams, and of course, the whale. <laughs> and you, 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 you will come across these sites doing internet searches for cancer or just about any other health issue. Maybe not so much the whale anymore, it's kind of, uh, uh, but Mercola gets as much traffic as the NIH website. Okay, uh, Tr Trini Suderos reported that, you know, a few months ago. I'm, uh, you know, it's a serious force designed to sell. So Mercola, you know, this is just a simple one, you know. It, 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 you know, cell phones may trigger ADHD. That's actually a mild one from him. I'll show you something worse later. Um, you know, drug company, conspiracy mongering, it, it, it's all there. Natural news, okay, hell no GMO. Uh, my favorite one is in the bottom, and it's a little hard to read, but it, it, the discovery of the Higgs boson actually may be the, uh, the evidence of the power of consciousness. Uh, <laughs> Mike Adams is, a, is an all, you know, is a, he doesn't discriminate. He's into just about every uh, form of pseudoscience you can think of. Uh, he's also into some really seriously nasty attacks on, you know, con conventional medicine. For instance, this is his view of chemotherapy. It's, you know, it's, there it is. It's a um, concentration camp where the guards are walking around with giant syringes and marching people into what are clearly meant to look like um, Nazi gas chambers. Or there's this one, uh, you know, about breast cancer, where you know they're used, supposedly they're using pink ribbons to tie up women and force them into the cancer treatment center to be pumped full of the awful chemotherapy, you know, the horrible, awful chemotherapy. Uh, then of course there's a whale too. This, if there's a form of pseudoscience or conspiracy theory that exists, it'll be on whale. It'll be there. This thing's been around for probably longer than all of them. Um, and it's just incredible what you can find on there. I actually have my own page on there, so I feel quite honored by, by that. 
So what are some red flags? Now, now, the other thing we can talk about, what are some red flags? And these doesn't just, you know, doesn't apply just to cancer. It applies to pretty much everything. Um, but holistic. If you hear the word holistic, we treat the whole patient as though uh, primary care docs like Harriet do not. Um, it's, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a, uh, it, it's something that irritates you know, a lot of the primary care docs who do try to practice science-based medicine. We treat the real cause of cancer. Of course, that real cause is uh, utter nonsense based on pseudoscience, and I'll show you a few examples in a minute, but we treat the real cause. Or our treatment is natural, okay? It's, it's not like that unnatural chemotherapy that comes from, uh, oh, bark of a tree, you know, like Taxol, that, that nasty uh, plant there, that nasty tree. Now, here's my favorite. Cancer is not really a disease, but a manifestation of something else. In, so, in one case, for instance, a German new medicine, it's a manifestation of some buried emotional trauma that your body's trying to get rid of by giving you cancer and killing you. <laughs> um, or, as I'll show, I'll show a couple of other examples later, but it, 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 some of these can get to be quite ridiculous. And of course, it's been used to treat cancer for centuries. So is bloodletting, you know, and see how well that works for most things. And of course, toxins. It's always the toxins. Um, not much to say about that. I gave a, we, we gave a whole session last year on alt-med toxins, uh, or basically. <laughs> and of course, there are, now, now one thing that also, you know, is very common are serious attacks on SBM, you know, on science-based medicine. I showed you some of Mike Adams's, but for cancer, this is a common one that you'll see, okay? The three approved paths to the graveyard. Cut, burn, poison. Cut, burn, poison. Sometimes it's cut, poison, burn, as in this movie that just came out. I've been meaning to try to get a copy of this and review it. Um, I don't know if I can stand to watch it, but <laughs> it's, uh, I've done it before for things like The Beautiful Truth and Gearson Therapy and a couple <laughs> anti-vaccine movies, so I suppose I could do it for this one. But I'll give you, an, I'll give you one, here, here's one pearl though that is about as close to 100% reliable as I know of. If you see one word on a cancer site, this word, spelled this way, disease. This is what you must do. <laughs> because you're on a quack site, without a doubt. This is about as close to 100% reliable as anything I've ever found. So what are some common cancer gambits? These are the sorts of things you will find on the internet. And they, they I'll, I'll pick just for, you know, brief versions of them, but they, they metastasize. You know, I, can't, I know, I can't help but use that term. <laughs> but uh, you will find these. How about this one? The 70, I call it the 75% gambit. Here's an example of it from a guy by the name of Tullio Simoncini, who I will tell you a little bit about later. 75% of MDs refuse chemotherapy themselves if they get cancer. Wow, sounds pretty damning, doesn't it? We won't take our own medicine. It's based on a survey from 1985 that was basically looking at one form of chemotherapy that was new at the time, cisplatin, for lung cancer, for advanced lung cancer. And it still wasn't clear that it was a good therapy for lung cancer. So 75% of docs were like, I don't think I would use it. More recent surveys, there was a follow-up survey that they never cite, which uh, it give, it basically says the question, it gives you the question, you have stage four lung cancer, would you take chemotherapy? 64% said yes. Now, th and there are other surveys out there with similar questions where it's as, it's as high as 98% of physicians would say yes. I've known several physicians who've taken chemotherapy for cancer. You know, it's, it's, it's nonsense. We, you know, we take 
standard of care therapy, most of us, um, except for may, perhaps some of us who may have gone uh, to the dark side. But uh, you know, physicians basically take chemotherapy just like anyone else when they get cancer. Now here's another one, the 2% gambit. This is Joe Mercola because this is um, the version I'm going to cite you comes from Joe. Chemotherapy has an average five-year survival success rate of just over 2% for all cancers. Sounds pretty horrible. Only 2% with all that toxicity? Turns out, if you dig, it's based on two papers. One paper came out of Australia in 2004. Another paper is by the, a, a guy named Ulrich Abel and was published in 1992. The second paper is often represented as having been published in The Lancet. I went and looked at The Lancet at the dates that they, you know, in a whole date range that they claimed that it was published, and it, no, not in The Lancet. It's in a relatively obscure journal. There are a lot of problems with these. Both of these, but I, I'll boil it down since this is a short talk, because I, I, I could actually go, you know, spend several minutes going through this. But both excluded leukemias and lymphomas, which are the most chemosensitive cancers, the ones that chemotherapy can actually cure. Um, they mix up adjuvant and, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, curative intent chemotherapy. A and basically, they do everything they can to minimize the seeming effectiveness of chemotherapy. Now, it is true that chemotherapy is not very effective for a lot of solid malignancies when they reach stage four. That, that's you know, one of the last frontiers that we have to overcome as cancer doctors. However, chemotherapy can still be surprisingly good for palliation. And even when it only prolongs life a few months, to those cancer patients, that could mean the difference between seeing their child graduate and not, or something like that. So, it, you know, when people, so it's a complicated issue, and I, and I could perhaps do a whole talk on it, but the, the bottom line is both, you know, the papers that they look at both had, have methodologic problems that almost seem custom designed to minimize the effect that they noted. Um, now here's my favorite. It's the zero percent, not satisfied that all, chemotherapy only works 2% of the time to prolong life. We have Mike Adams saying, there is not a single cancer patient that has ever been cured by chemotherapy. Zero, they don't exist. Not a single documented case in the history of Western medicine. Um, it seemed rather stupid to me to make such an absolute claim, doesn't it? And Lance Armstrong agrees. <laughs> And, and so do just about, you know, so do just about any child ever cured of childhood cancers, which were death sentences 50 years ago and are now, you know, between 80 and 90 percent survivable, with chemotherapy being the main treatment. Now, here's a little rogues gallery that, I'll, I, that you will encounter. Um, I picked these as kind of my personal favorites because there are more, but <coughs> they do represent some of the stuff, you, some of the nuttiness you can easily come across. So Hulda Clark, does anyone remember Hulda Clark? Yes. Her, her theory, and I use the word loosely, is that all cancers are caused by a parasite, and the parasite is a human intestinal fluke. Um, right there in the corner is a nice little illustration of it. And she claims to have the, she claimed, as you'll see, to have the cure for all cancers. You have to get rid of the parasite. Uh, oh, there's also all this stuff about propyl alcohol that I, I never figured out where the heck she came up with that. And, um, you know, um, various things that she said to, you had to do. The main thing is she came up with this, this thing called a zapper. <laughs> and this is the thing that will zap you, zap your flukes. You know, it's like, and doesn't it kind of look like a Scientology e-meter? <laughs> it's pretty much the same circuit. Um, <laughs> And she claims that it's 100% effective, regardless of the type of cancer or how advanced that it might be. 
You can even buy it on Amazon. Oh, there's more stuff you can buy on Amazon. Um, but uh, it, you, can, you can buy Miracle Mineral Solution on Amazon. That's bleach. You know, th th that's the bleach cure that, we've, that I wrote about not too long ago. I could do a whole talk on that, too. But anyway, so does it work? I don't think so. Um, Hulda Clark died about three years ago of multiple myeloma. And yeah, you know, it's, it's sad, but it, it's sad, but it's also ironic and appropriate, I think. <laughs> uh, because she sold this nonsense to so many people. It's just, you know, unbelievable. There's the Gerson therapy. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of this, but you will come across it. The movie that I mentioned before, The Beautiful Truth, was all about the Gerson therapy. And basically to him, cancer is due to toxins, those lovely Altmed toxins. And detoxification is the cure, but how, how, I, how you ask, do we detoxify? Well, the therapy involves juices, dietary modifications, tons of supplements, and coffee enemas. <laughs> yep. I, you know, I, I never could understand that one. I personally like my coffee the normal way. Um, <laughs> but that's what, that's the treatment. You will find it online. It's everywhere. And in fact, uh, the Gonzalez therapy that we talked, uh, Nicholas Gonzalez's therapy is basically very similar to Gerson's therapy. It sort of developed from it. <sighs> Stanislav Brzezinski. You may recall, and the regular readers may remember, I wrote about him a lot towards the end of last year because one of his uh, attack poodles uh, was threatening a bunch of skeptics who, was, who were writing, you know, that basically his stuff didn't work and it was wrong of him to be charging tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to desperate cancer patients um, and not doing the clinical trial, even really doing real clinical trials. Um, he claims to have discovered natural tumor-fighting substances from the urine, um, which he dubbed antineoplastons. It turns out that the main antineoplaston is actually ver uh, sodium phenylbutyrate. Basically, his MO is this. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, he was told that he could not sell antineoplastons across state lines, and he could not treat patients with them except as part of a clinical trial. So what's his solution? He has like 60 open clinical trials that never really accrue enough patients and he still charges patients to be on these clinical trials which is generally considered very ethically dubious. Lately he's been jumping on the genomics bandwagon and doing what he calls personalized gene targeted cancer therapy or what I call basically is, is um, personalized therapy for dummies. Uh, it's he basically tries to pick, uh, pick various targeted chemotherapy agents based on <coughs> these genomics tests that he has no idea how to interpret. Um, which is the funny thing because he's held up as a paragon of natural treatment, but he uses a ton of chemotherapy in a lot of his treatments. And in fact, his antineoplastons are fairly toxic. Here's another one, Tulio Simoncini, cancer is a fungus. That, you'll love the reason why he concluded that cancer is a fungus. He said, cancer is white. <laughs> fungus is white. <laughs> cancer is a fungus. I wish I were joking, but I'm not. <laughs> In any case, I'll just kind of blast through this because this stuff is uh, all, you know, Canada attacks different tissues, it, it, it mutates. The thing you need to know, because you will come across this, not just from him, but from the next guy I'm going to talk about, is how you treat the fungus. So how do you get rid of it? There's the fungus. No, it's not coffee enemas. I heard that. <laughs> Baking soda. <laughs> Baking soda cures cancer. Because, <coughs> because it's alkaline, I guess. And this guy has injected pe women with breast cancer with baking soda directly into their tumors to the point where he 
screwed them up so bad he killed them. But to him, it's like, this is the cure. It'll, everybody will be happy. But that brings us to Robert O. Young, who I talked about before on several occasions. So he basically, um, that, par that caricature of him, by the way, actually hangs in his uh, office because <laughs> I've, I've seen it discussed. He thinks acid causes cancer. Acid is actually the cause of all diseases to him. And he says things such as, you know, he, he calls it the new biology, which anytime anyone calls their stuff the new biology, that's a, actually another time to run away. Um, but there's no, you know, he says there's no such thing as a cancer cell. A cancer cell was once a, once a healthy cell that, was been spoiled by, that has been spoiled by acid. The tumor is not the problem, but it's there to protect the healthy tissues from being spoiled by other rotting cells. That, this is what I mean when they say that, you know, they say that cancer isn't the disease. His treatment, of course, is basically the same as Simoncini's. Now, here's another problem. Discussion forums, these are very big in the cancer community. And here's one that looks like it should be perfectly reputable, breastcancer.org. And I just found out about this, like, within the last few days, so I added it to the talk. It has some nice things, like, you know, connecting with others with the diagnosis, treatments and side effects, um, you know, but it starts to get a little dicey fairly quickly. For instance, there's in the, you can find the alternative medicine section. There's a section on baking soda and cancer. There's also a disclaimer, which I'll get to in a minute. Elsewhere, how can we make this truly safe, supportive, and judgment free? In other words, they're getting upset because some skeptics come in there and say, you know, this stuff is quackery. What are we doing? You know, promoting, you know, allowing a place for people to promote it. And there were actually, there's actually evidence that some of the people in there are selling the stuff that they're trying to um, promote to breast cancer patients. But here's the, here's another thing to look for. It has the quack Miranda warning. And th this, this comes in various t forms, various, wordings, but it all comes down to the same thing, that what we're selling you is not medical device. We're not claiming to diagnose or treat anything, so do it at your own risk, but we're going to give it to you anyway. So let's, you know, I have a basically, and, and basically all they're selling is testimonials. They're not selling science. They're not selling, um, you know, randomized clinical trials. They're selling single patients who claim that something cured them. And there, I have two laws of testimonials. Whenever a believer in alt-med uses both science-based medicine and alt-med and gets better, he will always attribute the good fortune to the alt-med, not to the science-based medicine. If a patient uses alt-med and science-based medicine dies, it's always the fault of the scientific medicine, and particularly if chemotherapy was involved. So let's take a look at this testimonial. Look at, it says, a woman stuns researchers by directing, by Overcoming her cancer with turmeric spice. Okay. So we look a little more closely. And here's the news story that it's based on. Okay. Breast cancer survivor used superfoods to combat her disease. But if you read, you'll see Vicki from Plymouth, Devon, told how she had an operation to remove a, bre to remove a breast and a lymph node. She actually underwent <coughs> chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery. <laughs> but it was the turmeric spice that cured her, right? <laughs> so, oh, oh, there we go. Here's another one. This showed up on that wretched, wretched hive of scum and quackery that I like to call the Huffington Post. Um, it's about Annie Fonfa, who formed, you know, basically... Uh, was it the Annie Appleseed Project? She claims that a lot of alternative medicine helped her a lot. But if you look a little closer, it talks about how she had a lumpectomy, or basically an excisional biopsy, followed by a mastectomy. You know, followed by a mastectomy. You know, here, first off, the first part shows, oh, you know, the alternative medicine is, you know, what cured her. The second part is, oh, well, she had a lumpectomy. Oh, and it was followed by a mastectomy. So 
basically let's, you know, primary, so what you gotta understand is primary therapy versus adjuvant therapy, what she's doing is the adjuvant therapy, you know, skipping the adjuvant therapy when the surgery was the primary therapy. And you can find a ton of these on the internet. There's basically uh, this one, same story, she had a lumpectomy and surgery, skipped her chemotherapy, she thinks that the alternative medicine cured her. Suzanne Summers, same thing. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work out so well. I don't know if you remember Kim Tinkham. She was on Oprah. She basically said that she was going to use Robert O. Young's treatment for herself. She didn't have surgery. She didn't have anything. She started out, on, you know, looking real healthy. She has Cancer Angel website. Then a little later, support King Kim Tinkham. Her, her cancer relapsed. And then two years ago, on Facebook, this was announced that she had unfortunately passed away. So I'm just going to skip through this because I'm running out of time. But uh, basically, the, you know, the most common confounder is, you know, whether is the cancer present? Did it go away? Was advanced treatment the only one used? Was it adjuvant versus uh, primary treatment? And a lot of this is not told. And sometimes these things are just made up or the, you know, people are saying things that just aren't true. So I'll, I'll just conclude with uh, one of my favorite guys. I don't always research cancer on the internet, but when I do, I only use cancer.gov and cancer.org. <laughs> Thank you. David. So I'm going to cover the side of the story now to do with vaccination and finding uh, accurate information online. Uh, so I'm going to get straight into it. Why do people or parents fear vaccines? Um, I guess the first thing is that vaccines are really a victim of their own success in many ways. Most of us no longer see vaccine preventable diseases in the community. Uh, some of us here may remember people that had polio or that had measles, um, but we don't see it anymore, so it's out of mind, out of sight. So as a result of this, people tend to, um, I guess, uh, increase the hypothetical risk or the small risk that we know about in medicine of side effects from vaccines. And if you look anywhere on the internet, you find plenty of misinformation with this um, in mind. And of course, this leads to parents getting scared um, and um, often delaying vaccines and also um, either delaying them or not getting them at all. And this can have tragic consequences, not only for yourself or your children, but for other vulnerable people in the community. Because we lose things um, called herd immunity. So we lose the protection within the community. So, um, as Steve mentioned, the, the three main sources really that people use to search for information about vaccines is really health professionals, which is obviously a good thing in most cases, unless you're asking Joseph McCullough. Um, the media, the general media, so the news media, newspapers, and then online. Um, and with respect to the traditional media, um, in the US now about 11% of nightly news shows tend to have stories concerning health. But as Steve has already mentioned, a lot of those journos are generalists, they're not health specialists. And so quite often those stories may contain errors. Um, they may not be accurate. They're not designed as documentaries of a science nature. They're usually a few minutes at the end of a news um, broadcast. And so sometimes those errors can actually lead to misinformation and then harm. Um, and as Steve has also said, they could just be a promotional story for some quack who's selling some new cancer cure. And of course, the other thing is this favourite practice of the media, which we call false balance, where they get on the other side of the opinion. Um, and of course, when it comes to things like politics or um, just opinion stories, this is well and good. But often with health and medical information, there isn't another side to the story. So if the consensus for the effectiveness of vaccines is 95% of people say that they work and they're effective and they're safe, and 0.2% of the medical community says that they cause autism, why would you give those two people 50% of the time on a news show? 
And I've just added here because celebrities, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a moment. Uh, so studies have been done looking at um, how Dr. Google can misdiagnose people and lead to people actually mistreating um, themselves, in fact. There's a study from the UK that's quite recent which um, took a thousand women and got them to uh, search for things including breast cancer, thrush and high blood pressure and about 25% of them misdiagnosed themselves and then 50% actually um, self-diagnosed incorrectly and they put up with pain and suffering from this self-medication for quite a long time before they sought the advice of a health professional. Um, in Australia, and it's probably about the same in the States now, about half of us use the internet to self-diagnose and two-thirds of us will research our medicines, which is not necessarily a bad thing as long as you're finding accurate information. And this statistic, I think I found this really interesting and when I first heard it, I thought that sounds really bizarre, but when you think about it, I think it's actually right. 97% of us only look on page one of Google. Now, I know that I do that. Unless I'm looking for something very specific, it's unusual for me to go past page one. So the important thing about this is if the accurate information that you need is not on page one, if you're getting your Macaulay's and your whale twos up on the top ten results, then that's what most people will see. And this indeed is the case for vaccination. So if you do a search for vaccination on google.com, this is page one, you get whale two um, coming up. You get the National Vaccine Information Service, which is run by Barbara Lowe Fisher. You get Vaccine Liberation. And you get Mike Adams Natural News. Um, if you go to a Google image search, you get even more scary <laughs> stuff. Um, some of you might be familiar with David Icke, who's a famous conspiracy theorist from the UK. Now, he's OK, he's pretty extreme. But this stuff will come up in Google Images. So we've got pictures of kids being chased by oversized syringes. We've got um, a vial with a pox-ridden hand showing as vaccination goes up, autism goes up. Nana is being tasered here. I'm not really sure why. And babies with syringes coming out of them. And this sort of stuff is scare, it scares people. And it sticks in your mind and it affects people's decisions down the line. So the problem we have really is that we've got high quality information which is equally available as misinformation. And one of the things that is driving the force behind this in terms of misinformation on Web 2.0, as we call it, is this thing called the current postmodern medical paradigm. And basically, this involves individuals wanting to take control of their health care. Um, and it's all about, you'll see these phrases um, often on natural health websites, do your own research, empower yourself before you make a decision. Vaccination, uh, anti-vaccination has used this stuff all the time. And, I mean, it's similar to what David was saying about Isaac Asimov. It's postmodernism is this idea that there's no wrong answer. Um, there's just another way of knowing things. So YouTube is also a place where you can find a lot of misinformation. Uh, there's a study from Vaccine Journal that found that about 32% of um, videos on YouTube opposed vaccination. But importantly, these videos had more ratings and um, more views than the accurate videos. And I found this really interesting too, that even spending as little as five minutes on a, a website that's anti-vaccination can affect people's decisions months down the track. And so I like to think of this as kind of like ringing a bell. Once you've rung a bell, you can't unring it. So by suggesting to parents or to anyone really that vaccines might be linked to autism, that sticks in people's mind and it impacts on their decisions as to whether they get vaccinated later. So I guess it wouldn't surprise you to know that when you do studies on this stuff, parents who got most of their information online with respect to vaccination are less likely to vaccinate their children as opposed to parents who do. And of course, the classic here is, our Jenny, is Jenny McCarthy, which you guys have given to the world, thanks for that. <laughs> um, she proudly claims that she learned everything she knows about autism from the University of Google. And she doesn't need science. And she said this on Oprah, that Evan, her son, who apparently had autism but apparently hasn't anymore, is her science. She doesn't need the science. She has him at home every day. That's her science. So I just want to show you a short excerpt from a video that I found on YouTube to give you some idea of the sort of stuff that you'll find. OK, 
Okay, I deliberately edited that to less than five minutes so that it wouldn't stick in your minds months later. <laughs> but if you, want, if you want to see the full one minute, 30 seconds, I can give it to you another time. Um, so the other thing that um, you'll find is things like this. This is a lovely book that has just been, uh, is being sold by the Australian Vaccination Network, the Australian Anti-Vaxxers. It's called Melanie's Marvelous Measles. And it's about a, it's designed for children aged four to 10 and it takes them on a journey of discovery to learn about the ineffectiveness of vaccines and to teach them to embrace their childhood illnesses. Now, interestingly, Meryl Dory, who's the president of this organization, says that the word measles is Sanskrit to mean a gift from the goddess. And apparently children that get measles will get a growth burst after they've had it, which indicates that it's good for them. But of course, in reality, we know that measles is not a gift from the goddess. And you know, in 2010, over 139,000 kids died of measles, and it leads to complications. And once the vaccine was introduced, there was a reduction in cases by about 74%. So that's the science, that's the pseudoscience. The other thing that you'll find on anti-vaccination websites is um, everything's a motive. So there's a, an emotion behind the information they present. Um, and they rely on a distrust of conventional medicine. And some of the things that they address, um, they, all of them, that this is a survey done in vaccine by Anna Katta, looking at a bunch of anti-vaccination websites. They all question the safety and effectiveness of vaccines. Um, most of them promoted alternative medicine. They all questioned its civil liberties and said, but it's our civil rights to deny getting vaccinated. A lot of them were full of conspiracies, well, 100% of them. They wanted the search for the truth and it's all a big pharma conspiracy. And the emotive appeals and misinformation and falsehoods was in the majority. Now, this is a really interesting piece of data, I think. This is also from Anna Katta. Um, this was published earlier this year. She did a survey of a series of anti-vaccination websites and then, of, sorry, she, she typed the term vaccination into google.com and then worked out the number of websites that were anti-vaccine versus accurate. Now, on the left here, you can see when you type vaccine into google.com in the blue bar, that's the amount of websites that you get that are pro-vaccine. Sorry, let me just swap that around. So in the middle, type vaccination into google.com, 70% will be anti-vaccine, 29% will be pro. If you type vaccine, not vaccination, into google.com, you switch those statistics immediately. If you type immunization into google.com, 100% of the information you get is gonna be um, anti-vaccine. So it's an indication that the, the words that you type into um, a search engine are also gonna affect the amount of information that you get that's accurate versus not accurate. And of course, there's the sort of canards and tropes that the anti-vax crowd use. I'm not anti-vaccine, I'm pro-safe. They cherry pick scientific information um, to suggest that vaccines are not safe or effective. Uh, they try to discredit their dissenters, like the likes of Steve Novella and David Gorski. Um, and then they change, they move the goalposts as well. Um, so they, they change the villain. So in the, initially it was MMR caused autism, then it was thimerosal causes autism, and now it's just generally mercury or other toxins or too many too soon. Uh, and of course, they, they, just, they try to silence people by slapping lawsuits on them as well. And they're misleading in the, sort of, in the names that they use for their organisations. So the National Vaccine Information Centre doesn't particularly sound anti-vaccine. The Australian Vaccination Network doesn't sound anti-vaccine. Uh, and in fact, just last week in Australia, the Australian Medical Association was calling for the Australian Vaccination Network to change their name after the Midwives Association accidentally sent an invitation to the Australian Vaccination Network's um, seminars to over a thousand of their members because they didn't realise they were anti-vaccination. Now, celebrities. Um, this is a big problem because the way that uh, the internet works these days, a celebrity can open their mouth and, and condone something or say that a detox product works or that I used homeopathy to treat myself for malaria. And it, it gets stuck in our consciousness, it gets splashed all over the magazines, it gets splashed all over Google, and we're stuck with that forever. And as cited by Sense About Science, which is a charity in the UK, this becomes a problem. Here's our favourite, Jenny McCarthy on Oprah. 
She's given a lot of time in high-profile shows to talk about her theories that <laughs> vaccines are, uh, contain toxins. And in 2009, she went into Time magazine and said, look, it's not our fault that we're not vaccinating. If these companies cleaned up the vaccines, took out the toxins, then we'd use them. And those little lines that are, are in that are swear words, <laughs> which I won't <laughs> repeat. <laughs> And we're up against this, you know, we're up, we've got our people like Dr. Paul Offit, who's, the, who's preaching accurate science-based information, but, you know, he's not as pretty in a bikini and he just made a rotavirus vaccine and he's got all these, you know, letters after his name, but my God, it's so boring. Because, <laughs> you know, Jenny had this boyfriend who was really funny and the thing that's interesting about Jenny is she objects to toxins in vaccines, um, but she doesn't mind a cigarette every now and then. And she has said that, I really love Botox, I absolutely love it, I think it's a saviour. Which is kind of funny because it's one of the most toxic compounds known to man and she puts that in her face, but yeah. And of course, you know, doctors are not immune. Celebrities are guilty, yes, but doctors aren't either. We've got Wakefield who's, you know, responsible for one of the biggest health crises in the history of medicine. So where do you find good information? Um, there are places, there are lots of places, you just have to be careful. Um, this is one of the oldest codes um, that indicates an accurate website. It's called the Health on the Net Foundation. It's Swiss and it was established many years ago to try and indicate a website that contains accurate information. I want to just say as well before I tell you any more that this is not a 100% guarantee either. You still have to exercise scepticism. You will find websites that have the HON code stuck on them that are not HON certified because people can easily copy and paste this and stick it on their site. So you still have to use the tools that Steve and David have told you to determine if you really are getting the right information. But the nice thing about the HON code is websites, the HON website itself is a search engine. So you can go in here, you can type in vaccination, and then you have categories that you can select from as well. So you can choose if you want information as a health professional, as a patient, um, if you want it for children, for teens, <coughs> and that can give you, you can drill down the information you're after. Web of Trust is a crowdsourced tool, therefore it's open to abuse, obviously, um, and it just relies on people voting up or down websites. It's a browser plug-in. Um, it, it allows you to go and vote for sites based on their reliability in your opinion. And depending on the crowdsourced votes, um, sites will get a little red dot next to them or a green dot. And you can leave comments and say why you think this site is bad. This is a screenshot from the reviews of the Australian Vaccination Network. And by the way, they've got a red dot meaning not a safe site and they completely blame us for that. <laughs> but if you look at the comments, we didn't do it all. And in fact, we didn't even know about what until they complained that we'd done it. And then of course we went there and voted. <laughs> um, and if you have that browser plug, if you have that browser plug-in, you'll type in vaccination to Google and you can see you get a green dot next to the wiki entry, a red dot next to the Australian Vaccination Network, and it just gives you a rough idea of how people have interpreted the information on that site. Um, as Steve's already covered a lot of this, so I'll just quickly go through it. So you want to you want to make sure that the website has um, is dis discloses who owns it, who's running it. If it's just one person, be aware who's paying for it. The quality of information, is it coming from a bunch of experts or just one person? Are they citing scientific information or is it purely references that um, they've got from Whale 2 or Macola? And also be careful with this because um, quacks can also cite scientific papers but they can use them in the wrong way. How much is the information complete? Is it cherry picked? Is it all there? And are there lots of anecdotes and testimonials? Because if there are, you should avoid it. This is something I just came across in the last few days and I think this is really fantastic. This is the WHO, the World Health Organization, have actually conducted a project called the Vaccine Safety Net. And what they're doing is going through websites that provide vaccine information and determining if they're safe and um, accurate. And then they're giving them sort of a WHO stamp of approval, which means that you can rely on them for accurate information. Um, there's a list of approved websites through the WHO um, there's a URL there which is really long, but I'm sure if you search the WHO for Vaccine Safety Net, you'll find the list. The list is, at the moment, very long. Um, it's got sites from all over the world. 
uh, in different languages. Um, and it gives you a guarantee that you're going to find something good. There's also a search engine called Vax Facts, um, which is from the UK, which just overnight added a link to this so that you can find the WHO stuff. So obviously the other ones are the CDC, the WHO, the National Network for Immunisation is also a good site, um, and the uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which is where Dr Paul Offit's from, uh, and the Immunise Action Coalition. All of these you'll find through the WHO. And the standard sort of Medline Plus and WebMD, um, NHS Choices, which is a UK site, but it's also very good for general information. And of course, Google Scholar. Some of these are a problem because the papers on there will be paywalled. So you won't be able to access them unless you've got a subscription. <coughs> so I want to just finish up by showing you um, a video about celebrities and science. I think it's self-explanatory. Hi, I'm Terence Luthen. Like millions of Americans, I know the facts about vaccines. I know Andrew Wakefield recently lost his medical license for fraudulently researching the connection between autism and vaccines. I know vaccines are supposed to be essential to improving public health. But I also know that all of this information comes from scientists and medical doctors <laughs> and is based on something called research. As an American, I rely on a much more credible source of information, Jenny McCarthy. I've heard the British medical journals claim that the anti-vaccine <laughs> movement has caused such damage to public health as to be without precedent in human history. And it seemed fairly convincing until I realized that nobody at the British medical journal or expert Paul Offit is actually a celebrity. Look at Offit's body and face. Now let's see those very same parts on Jenny McCarthy. <laughs> Suddenly Offit's argument doesn't quite hold up. <laughs> the Center for Disease Control and the Food and Drug Administration have both condemned anti-vaccination claims as dangerous and misleading, but has anybody from these organizations ever co-hosted an MTV dating show? I think not. Advantage McCarthy. So I was obviously going to do the only sane thing and have my child vaccinated. But then I heard that Jenny McCarthy said that vaccines were dangerous. And she was in Scary Movie 3, so she must know about vaccines. In America, the better looking you are, the better smarter you are. Einstein can talk <laughs> all he wants about relativity, but look at his gnarly hair. Experts in the UK claim that because of the anti-vaccine movement, measles have become endemic for the first time in 14 years. And the incidence of mumps has risen between 13 and 37 times, but have any of these experts ever appeared on even one episode of Just Shoot Me? No. And Jenny McCarthy's been on three. Three! So you can keep your fancy facts and highfalutin information to yourself. I subscribe to something much stronger. The uninformed amateur convictions of Jenny McCarthy, American celebrity. That's it, thanks. <laughs> what do I do to make it play? Oh, left upper corner. Okay, we're in business. Uh, I kind of got shortchanged, but I've only got about 15 minutes worth of material, so if you can cut into your lunch hour a little bit, uh, I'll try to talk as fast as I can. My subject is Dr. Google and Complementary and Alternative Medicine, and that's 13 syllables, so I'm going to cut it down and just call it CAM. Um, what can I tell you about Googling for information about CAM? <laughs> Don't bother. 
I mean, seriously, by <laughs> definition, CAM is, is medicine that has not been adequately tested and proven to work. So if you find something on Dr. Google that says uh, one of those methods works, you know that's wrong. If you find something that says it hasn't been proved to work, well, you already knew that. But there might be other reasons to Google CAM. For instance, uh, you might Google it in the spirit of a visit to the zoo. We all like to go to the zoo to marvel at the variety of life forms and to chuckle at the monkey's <laughs> antics. And CAM is like a human zoo. There's a great variety of strange creatures whose vocalizations and behaviors can be very amusing. Like this breatharian who uh, says he lives on air and he swears he has not had anything to eat or drink for seven decades. Now, I don't know who's stranger, this guy or the guys in the, the doctors in the Indian Army who are studying him to find out how he does it so they can teach it to their troops. Um, just like people like to visit the zoo, they like to visit other worlds. They do that through travel, science fiction, psychedelic drugs, and role-playing games. But you can also do that through, through CAM. You may not find anything quite as strange as this picture that I found on the internet, but you can visit some pretty strange, surreal, alternate universes where germs don't cause disease, wild animals don't get sick, DNA has 12 strands, not two, Water has a memory, and you can prevent and cure every disease known to man if you just eat right. You might uh, want to go on an anthropology field trip to study other cultures and customs. You'll find a tribe that prefers imagination to reality, that has its own unique mythology, and practices bizarre customs like sticking lighted candles in their ears and drinking their own urine. Did you find us through, your, through our website? <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact. Uh, you could study human psychology. CAM is a great place uh, to learn about weird ideas, how they get started, how they get perpetuated. Or you could do it as an exercise in logic. It's a great place to play, uh, name that logical fallacy. You could do your homework for Logic 101 by finding examples on CAM. I think if Mr. Spock looked at the average CAM website, he would call it highly illogical. So I've had my fun, but now I'll try to get serious. Um, I, I have a hard time being serious about CAM because there's so much that is just batshit crazy <laughs> and rolling on the floor hilarious. And some of it, you, you've got to laugh or cry, and I'd rather laugh. But I try to make fun of the ideas and not of the people. Uh, these are not stupid people. They're not crazy. They're just misinformed and misguided. So I don't want to laugh at them. And there are a few of them that are con, con artists and scumbags, but we shouldn't be laughing at them either. We should be figuring out how to stop them. So seriously, the reason most of us Google for CAM is to find out if a health claim is credible. Is it science? Is it scam? Is it speculation? And I do this all the time. And um, I thought it would be helpful to show you exactly how I go about it and let you follow along step by step as I investigate a typical questionable claim. If you remember Will Winnie the Pooh, they went on an expedition to the North Pole. Well, I'd like you to come with me on an expedition to the wilds of the Camiverse, uh, where we can uh, thrash our way through the, uh, through the Google jungle in search of the elusive truth. This particular expedition starts with a page in my local newspaper. Uh, at, a, at first glance, this looks like six columns of news, but the whole right half of this page is a, an advertisement for a diet supplement called Procera ABH. And if you have good vision and you're very alert, you might notice the little words paid advertisement in tiny print at the top, but they're counting on you not to do that. They want you to think it's a news article. The headline says, memory pill does for the brain what prescription glasses do for the eyes. Wouldn't that be wonderful? claims U.S. Surgeon General candidate. Well, <laughs> who is this guy? Um, they identified him as Dr. Paul Nimeroff, and it's easy to find him on Google. He's an MD and a PhD, great credentials, but he's also a TV medical journalist, and he has invented and sells his own diet supplement. The Procera website says he was invited to the White House where he was considered for Surgeon General of the United States. And I couldn't verify whether that was true or not, but even if it is, that doesn't carry much weight when you consider that one of our recent presidents followed the advice of an astrologer. 
Uh, it, it says that he's published hundreds of articles, he's done research, but when you look on PubMed, you can only find eight with his name. So my next step, it, it really doesn't matter who says it, what matters is whether what he's saying is true. So I went to the Procera website. The first thing I found there was a video with the title Breaking News that's intended to make you think it's from a TV news program, but it's actually just an infomercial with Dr. Nimeroff. There's a special offer, there's testimonials, and there's a clinical research tab. And I thought, well, if there's any evidence behind that, that's where I'll find it. But it didn't help very much. Uh, it uh, said a study was done, but it didn't provide any links or details or even any information that would help me locate the study. So I went back to the newspaper ad, and it said a randomized double-blind placebo control study published in a leading scientific journal. Well, I went to PubMed and Googled JAMA and Procera, nothing came up. So I went back to Google and I Googled JAMA Procera. And the first thing that, that, it, that came up was a news story in a Tampa newspaper that pointed out that it wasn't JAMA, but JANA. Boy, did I have egg on my face. I had done exactly what they expected me to do and I'd misread it as JAMA, which really is a, a respected journal. The JANA is the Journal of the American Nutraceutical Association. This is it's an obscure journal that was published erratically for a few years, was never listed in PubMed, and the only way you can get it today is to uh, buy the CD that has all the back issues. But I kept looking. There was a clue. The Procera website did happen to mention the name of the pr principal researcher. So I Googled his name with, along with Procera, and I found the study, and I read it. And then I asked, was this a good quality study? Well, in his book, Snake Oil Science, Bausell proposed a, a simple four-point checklist that'll give you an idea whether a study is likely to be credible. And I'll cover each of these on the next slide. Uh, first, was it randomized with a credible control? Well, this study probably was, but we really can't tell because they didn't describe the placebo, they didn't describe their randomization process and they didn't do any exit poll to see if the patients had been able to tell which group they were in. Were there over 50 subjects in each group? No, 43 and 31. Was the dropout rate less than 25%? Yes, it was 18%. Was it published in a high quality journal? Definitely not. So the highest grade I could give it is 50%, which is a fail. Here's what the study showed. Compared to a placebo group, the Procera group showed significantly more improvement in working memory accuracy, long-term memory consolidation, and one measure of mood, but not in all the other measures of mood or any of the other things that they, they look for, like information processing speed and reaction time. And it's important to remember that statistically significant doesn't mean clinically significant, and the magnitude of the changes in this study were small. Here's what the website claims that research showed. Uh, it's not important to read all the details, but you might notice that it says things like improved concentration, uh, self-confidence, re reduced anxiety and stress. That's not what the study showed. The study showed those three things in red. And compare that to what they're saying it said. Well, obviously they're misrepresenting the research, which is a polite way of saying that they're lying. So next I, I wondered what was in it, and it's easy to find the label on Google. Uh, the AVH and Procera AVH stand for acetyl L-carnitine, venpocetine, and huprazine A. How much of each? They're not telling. They've mixed it into some kind of a proprietary blend, and they tell you the total amount. So the next obvious question is, do we have any evidence that any of these three ingredients actually does anything to improve memory? Well, the first place I looked was PubMed, and when I go there, I put it in as a, a, a clinical query, which cuts out some of the extraneous results. Um, and I looked, I looked for Cochrane reviews. The Cochrane system uh, is like the gold standard for evidence-based medicine. Uh, they do reviews where they look at uh, the, everything that's been published in the literature, and they try to put it together and make sense out of it. I use Wikipedia a lot. Uh, I know people make fun of Wikipedia, but it's, it's really pretty good most of the time. It's a good place to start and get an overview. And they give you references so you can go look at the uh, original documents and make up your own mind from them. And I use the Natural Medicines Comprehensive Database, which is, I consider that the, uh, the Bible of natural medicine information. Unfortunately, it's subscription only. But it said, uh, it, uh, 
it listed all three of these ingredients and it gave them possibly effective ratings for dementia. Um, safety ratings ranged from possibly safe <coughs> to likely safe. They listed a lot of adverse reactions and interactions with drugs. And when I combined the information from all these different sources, here's what it boiled down to. For venpositine, uh, there was one study in healthy people with only 12 subjects. And the Cochrane Review found three studies in adults with dementia and said it was inconclusive. For huperzine A, there was one small study of normal people and some favorable studies in people with dementia. Uh, the Cochrane Review found inadequate evidence to make any recommendations. For acetyl L-carnitine, the Cochrane Review found that all the available studies were on Alzheimer's disease, and there was some evidence of benefit, but there was no evidence using any objective assessments, so not much. There was another website selling Procera, the Brain Research Labs, and they had a big long list of more studies, but they didn't amount to much. Um, they had things, uh, test tube studies and rat studies like this one. Uh, they had, uh, studies venpositine for coagulation. That doesn't have anything to do with memory. And they had a study of oxidative damage and mitochondrial delay in aging, which doesn't have anything to do with memory and it doesn't have anything to do with any of the components in the, in the product. No clinical studies of Procera. Okay, um, what about the marketing ploys? Well, in the original ad, they had pictures of a research facility building and a doctor in a white coat. Um, and they had this picture of eyeglasses and an eye chart to emphasize their false analogy with glasses. But wait, there's more. 90-day satisfaction guarantee. Free rapid brain detox formula to the first 500 callers. Lots of testimonials, frankly false statements like Huperzine has been shown to improve learning and memory at all ages. Well, we've just looked at the evidence and we've seen that that isn't true and bombastic language like time travel for your brain. <laughs> well, boys and girls, this is salesmanship. This is not science. So my next step was to Google for criticism of Procera. So I, I didn't find anything on the usual skeptical websites and blogs. So next I Googled for Procera reviews. And most reviews amount to testimonials by people who review it by trying it themselves, and if they think it works, they want to tell the world. So I finally hit pay dirt at a place called supplementgeek.com. And Supplement Geek had found a lot of interesting information. The company's address is a res residential area. There's no company website, just the Procera website. They're in the bad graces of the Better Business Bureau. Bureau, and when he phoned the company to ask a question, that led to a whole series of aggressive phone calls trying to sell him the product. He found that when you buy from them, you're automatically enrolled in an automatic shipment program that charges your credit card $134 every month until you specifically tell them to stop. The TV commercials are misleading. Dr. Nemiroff has a financial interest in selling it. And the guy who invented this stuff, uh, there's no, there's no evidence that he has any background in science, and he's definitely not an MD or a PhD. Now, they've learned what we Google for, so if you try Googling for Procera and scam, you get testimonials saying, it isn't a scam. And if you Google for Procera and skeptical, you get, I was skeptical, but I tried it and it worked for me. <laughs> so is this science, scam, or speculation? Well, it's clearly not science and the evidence is low quality and inconclusive. They've got false and overhyped uh, claims. So if it isn't a scam, it's speculation that's been wildly extrapolated from a grain of truth. Does it actually work for anything? Well, we have absolutely no way of knowing because it hasn't been properly tested. Now, anyone can do what I did. You can follow in my footsteps. You don't have to be a doctor or a scientist to, to do this sort of thing. And I have a rule that I think will be very helpful. Before you accept any claim, try to find out who disagrees with it and why. And when you do that and look at the arguments on both sides, it's, it's usually crystal clear which side is right. Um, you can brainstorm and look at all sorts of places, starting with Quackwatch, science-based medicine, and skeptical blogs. 
You can look up the people. You can look on Amazon for customer reviews. You can look at the Better Business Bureau and the product name and complaints. And you can be creative and you can probably think of a lot of things that I didn't think of. And look for red flags. These have been covered before, so I'm just going to skip over them. If you still can't find anyone who disagrees, that may mean something in itself, because people disagree about everything, even about whether men actually went to the moon. So if there's no disagreement on the internet yet, it's probably because it either it's too new or because it's so silly that reputable scientists don't take it seriously enough to even talk about it. So in, if you can't find any disagreement, your best bet is just to withhold judgment. There's always disagreement. The TV says studies show people are more likely to disagree with something than agree with it. And the guy says, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so if you just remember to look for who disagrees with it and why, that'll go a long ways towards taming Dr. Google and making him work for you instead of against you. Everybody uses Google, even Bart Simpson. He's, he's writing, I will use Google before asking dumb questions. Just don't overdo it. <laughs> Even skepticism can be overdone. I don't believe we've met. I don't believe you don't believe we've met. <laughs> That's all. <coughs> Thank you. Well, our, our various talks were so comprehensive and thorough, there's no need for any questions. <laughs> Uh, so we'll just end right there, but um, if you do want to come up and chat in the break afterwards, we'll be happy to hang out. Thanks.